Okay. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I'm glad that you are here to have to see us. Um, thank you all who traveled and have to suck it up and come to Orlando to visit us, or me. Uh, my name is Paula Lupton. I work for Involved People Care, serving Sunshine Health. So stop by and see our Sunshine Health booth and say hi to Linda. Um, I've been with Sunshine for almost four years. I'm one of their child welfare trainers, so I'm very, very happy that this is my job, that I actually get to travel around and talk about trauma and toxic stress. Um, and before that, I'm an LCSW in the state of Florida, and I ran a 24-hour crisis unit uh, down here for four counties for about 11 years, so I know a little bit about toxic stress, just a little. And I'm with my lovely co-trainer. I'm lovely. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, first and foremost, wanted to just say what an honor it is to speak with all of you. Uh, been working in child welfare for a long time, and uh, the work that you all do is just, uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing, and uh, you all deserve so much credit and appreciation for what you do. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Chad Saddam. Uh, I've been a therapist for more years than I'm going to tell you about. Um, I uh, live in Tallahassee, Florida, and I'm a professor at a university up there, which we apparently are not supposed to talk about in this part of the state. So, go Knights! <laughs> oh wow, that's really loud. I, and I'm assuming you can all hear me all right. We all good? All right. Um, basically, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I'm actually a, a Penn State Nittany Lion fan. I'll put that over my your Nittany Lion. Yeah. Penn State. Well, we, uh, I grew up there, um, went up to Massachusetts for my master's, and uh, been working, like I said, for many years uh, in child welfare, specializing in children and adolescents with behavioral anomalies and various mental health concerns. Um, one of the big issues that uh, we, we present on, and I, I do the exact same job that Paula does just in the North Florida area, so Pensacola over to Jacksonville down to Gainesville, so if any of you are from that area and you'd like some additional trainings, by all means, come see me afterwards. I'll give you my business card, we'll exchange phone numbers, Facebook addresses, we'll become buddies, and we'll hang out. Um, but without further ado, again, thank you all so much, and we're gonna be presenting on the effects of toxic stress on brain development. So our objectives for today, identify the different regions of the brain and identify their major roles. Don't worry, this is not going to be a full-on anatomy and physiology class. I see people's eyes glazing over already. So just basic overview on what goes on where and why. We're going to define toxic stress. We're going to define a couple of different types of stress, but again, we're going to focus mostly on toxic stress. We're going to distinguish between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, fight, flight, freeze, versus uh, the uh, parasympathetic where we calm back down. Uh, for each area of the brain, we're going to explain one way toxic stress alters its structure or activity. So we can understand how stress affects the actual anatomy and physiology of the brain and how we as therapists, how we as guardians, how we as attorneys need to be cognizant of that type of uh, activity going on and work with people that way. Also, we're going to describe how changes in the brain can impact behavioral, social, and emotional functioning. Kind of just hinted at that with the last part we just talked about. Apparently, I'm having clicker issues, okay. so I I'm think the that official might be clicker. your job. This is part of being a university <laughs> professor. We both work with our clickers. I'm actually becoming a clicker pro. All right, so the reason we put this up there is a lot of times our kids, and when we go through trauma, uh, we end up in primitive brain, lizard brain, trunk brain, whatever term. And I wanted you guys to know, although we're going to talk a lot about the brain, uh, we're not going to be all up with the neuroscience. So I wanted to start the lightning of the lightning up of things to say we know this is where we're starting from when we talk, talk about toxic stress. All right, brain structure. Okay, one thing you know, people learn different ways. Some people are visual, some people are auditory, some people are hands-on tactile. She's going to show you the brain, right? You can do this for yourself if you'd like to. Well, here. Take I, your I'm hand and hold up like this. Okay. Starting off, we have the brain stem, okay? That's the spinal column coming up into the back of the brain. Next, the cerebellum, or 
portion of the back back here with midbrain coming up to the cerebrum. And that's broken into multiple different parts, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe. They all do different things. Okay, maybe I'm not a pro at this. <laughs> maybe it just sticks a little. A little bit. We'll, we'll make it work. Do you have that? Oh, what? Go ahead. Oh, so when we're talking about the high brain, you know, we talk about that. Again, that's the, as Chad said, the upper spinal cord, the brain stem, the midbrain. The reason I like to talk about this part is I always like to bring up the midbrain is kind of our process of information. When we have information, when people are talking to us, when we're in a new environment, all the information pretty much comes in the midbrain. Uh, so it kind of delves out information where something comes in there and goes, are I safe? And if we go, okay, I'm not safe, that's when all of a sudden it pushes it down to our hindbrain, to our trunk brain. Now, if we know, okay, I'm safe, you're at a conference, none of you all have bags of tomatoes to throw at us, I'm gonna go all the way and send my information up to my forebrain, which is gonna be the part where I'm using my analytical thought, my reasoning, my ability to talk and hopefully communicate effectively. And when we look at that, that's the reason I like to break it into those three parts and that's that central part that just helps our kids process when we have information coming in. Okay, with the brainstem, okay, this is responsible for involuntary actions, basically survival. What is needed to live? What is needed to survive? Okay, the basic instinct, instinctual stuff that we need. Our cere cerebellum, that co coordinates our movement how we move, where, what, what muscles are, are functioning, those types of things. Cerebrum, most, development, uh, most developed part. Okay, this is cognition, reasoning, thought. This is broken up into the frontal lobe. I'm not sure, I'm sure, actually I'm almost 100% positive that people in the back cannot read that. Oh no, and when we look at this, the reason I like this, the frontal lobe, which is up here, is, has to do with decision making, problem solving, and planning. So when we talk about the use of our frontal lobe, or when we talk about traumatic brain injuries, where they have damage to their frontal lobe, we're talking about our reason and our problem solving ability. And that's where there can be some difficulty. When we talk about the temporal lobe, this is our memory, our emotions, hearing, language. So when we talk about the way we talk, the way we understand and interpret what's being said or we read messages, when we go up to the occipital lobe, that is our vision, and then when our parietal lobe is reception and process of sensory information. So when we have our kids that we're working with, and trauma can sometimes change their biology, and by that I mean they have a high pain tolerance. I've seen kids in the crisis unit, you know, they wipe out, the road rash gets cleaned up, don't even wince. But if you accidentally bump into them when you're talking or brush by them, a very big startle reflex because they have that high pain threshold but such a low touch tolerance. And you hear things like kids who've been through trauma, much like kids who have autism, when you touch them, it can't be a light touch. There has to be weight or pressure. So you can't just like, had them like this because it, the sensation is overwhelming because it's changed the way that their prior lobe processes sensory information. And you see a lot of kids with sensory issues, the kids that can't have the tags or the socks with the seams, you know, that certain types of clothing just to, they can't do it. And you also see because of this, I see a lot of people now they have weighted blankets that are 25 pounds because they need that pressure. And that's when changes with our parietal lobe. Now, as we're going through all this, I want you all to think about some of the clients with whom you've worked, okay? Kids that have come into the system, kids that as soon as you say something which may seem scary to them, you know, what happened at school today? The quick reaction, the I didn't do anything, nothing happened, when simply you're asking how was your day? Or Please clean up your room. Well, it's not my room, it's, it's, it's someone else's room. It's my roommate's stuff. It's, it's all them. Quickly jumping, quickly becoming agitated. Really short fuse, okay? Think of the kids that are coming into the homes, the very first thing they think about is, where's the food? 
in my room, where can I hide it? And what can I do in case I need to run? We have a lot of kids like this. You know, in the, in the past, as an STFC therapist, watching the kids, they, many that are coming in are very, very high strung. And when we're talking about these types of things coming up with toxic stress, there's a reason for that. And there's a way to go about working with them therapeutically. So just keep in mind those kids that you have on your caseloads. If you want to talk afterwards, please feel free. As far as confidentiality of your kids go, please don't speak up about them. Um, and there are attorneys in here too. Um, when we talk about the cerebral cortex, this is a part of our brain that's that high functioning part, that analytical. So when we have our kids that are really upset and we're like, hey, um, I need you to talk. Let's talk about what's going on. It is actually the size of two dimes stacked on top of each other. That's 20 cents in a developed brain. And if you know about the brain, we develop from the bottom up. So that means if we spend all of our time in crisis, not feeling physical or psychologically safe, when we're down here in that brain stem, we're not developing these higher brain functions as well. So. I had a question for Chad. Um, how young are the children that you offer therapy to for toxic stress? The youngest child that I have ever worked with who has been traumatized, um, gosh, let me think, was about 18 months old. Um, obviously, we're not gonna be talking, you know, sitting down, you know, lay down on the couch, tell me about your childhood, um, but more along the lines of being able to feel safe, being able to feel nurtured, being able to feel comforted. Uh, these types of things we worked on, um, working with the parents, to be able to demonstrate positive parenting bonding, um, how to build relationships with your children, how to talk to your child, those types of things. It's, uh, but yeah, probably, I'm, I'm, it was 17 or 18 months old was the youngest that I've worked with. But people have worked with children shortly after birth. Because again, as Paula mentioned, the brain develops from the base up. I mean, look at, a good example is, we're working with pets. I, I think I saw a dog in here, which is fantastic. I, I have such a, a respect for the, the people that are working with, with uh, uh, animal assisted therapy and all. But, um, okay, when we have a pet coming into our home, and we'll step aside from children for a moment, what do we need to do with that pet? We need to make it feel loved, right? Let it feel safe. Show it a place that is theirs, whether it's one of the little, what are they, not a kennel, but the crate, the crate. I'm, I want to get a dog, so I'm trying to remember all the stuff so I can tell my wife, hey, let's get a dog. I'm still working on it. It's been five years I've been working on getting a dog, so maybe I'm not the most effective therapist in the world. <laughs> but well, what, you, you what do we do? You can't therapist your family. What's that? You can't be a therapist to your family. That's, so that's true. Why. That's true. That, that's the downfall. But what, uh, what we need to do is provide that safety, allow that the dog, for, for, since we're going with the dog analogy, to feel like it, it is in an environment where it's able to flourish, able to grow. We've developed a baseline with, or again, again, say that dog, okay? From there, the dog knows who to come to when it needs to go out, where to go, scratching the door. Um, who's going to feed it? What time of day Generally, I mean, the dog's not going to be like checking its wristwatch or anything, but what time of day does it get to eat? Okay, we're not going to go all Pavlovian on it or anything, but then when the dog understands those types of basic things, what happens next? Hey, I just taught my dog to shake. My dog understands these words. When I say walk, the dog goes, grabs its leash, wags its tail, and is all excited. I taught my dog how to roll over. You can't do any of this stuff without first developing the sense of security, safety, and comfort. Now let's flip that back to kids. Let's flip back to any of us. If we don't feel safe, if we don't feel comfort, if we don't have our basic primitive needs met, are we able to have higher cognition? Or are we thinking of, how am I gonna survive? Think about our kids that way. 
A lot of these kids have been traumatized. They don't have someone who they can trust. They, don't, they, they get bounced from home to home. They don't know where their next bed is. They don't know where their next meal is. They don't know the rules to the new home. All these basic things. They may have to develop a new friend set. Will they see their parents again? Will they see their siblings again? What kind of security is there for them? So what we need to do therapeutically is provide a basic sense of understanding, safety, love, comfort, and security. Basic stuff, brainstem, on up. From there, we can start developing relationships. We can start developing the understanding of right from wrong. We can understand forethought, cognition. We can work on all that, but again, not until that is developed. So we pretty much went through this slide. Um, and when we talk about it, since we are talking about it, the d brain develops by forming connections. Think about how we learn something, that muscle memory. We have to do things over and over again. If I want to go play tennis, am I going to be good the first time? No, maybe not. Um, but we practice. If we want to learn an instrument, everything that we do, it's muscle memory. And it takes those connections and those times that we do things over and over again. And that's why what you guys do is so important. Because when I worked with kids in the child welfare system, by the time they got to me at the crisis unit and were teenagers, they'd been bounced around a lot. And some of the strongest connections or the most consistent people they had were the guardian med items, were some of the other people that were consistent between all the different places they were moving. And these connections, whether they're good or bad, but just like the bad ones, the good connections, we can help them with the toxic stress by the support that we give them, by encouraging and being there for them. Okay, next up we're talking about different types of stress. Okay, hey, first up, we've got our positive stress. It's moderate, brief, typically a normal part of, a, uh, part of life. It's essential for us to be able to develop. Okay, we all have stressors in our lives. Okay, simple things like, okay, entering a new childcare setting, okay? First day of school. Presenting at a conference. All right, things like this, things that are normal, everyday activities that occur to us all. Okay, getting in some rush hour traffic. Not Orlando traffic, again, I live in Tallahassee. The traffic in, like rush hour traffic in Tallahassee is like three in the morning here. I don't, I, what we're, speaking of toxic stress in a few minutes, driving in Orlando. I-4. Or, or Miami, we have some people here from Miami. I-4 this morning. <laughs> okay, next up is tolerable stress. This isn't something that happens on an everyday type of uh, basis, but things that are going to happen in our lives, all right? And there is potential for negative brain development here, okay? I don't want to upset anyone, but thinking of death of a loved one, someone close to us, okay? Those that are currently thinking about grandma or whomever, there's suddenly a little bit of, of sadness in our hearts, right? It's something that we don't ever get over, but it's something that is an event in our lives which has been a significant impact. Next up, we have toxic stress. Okay, this is strong, frequent, and prolonged activation of the body's stress response system. Fight, flight, freeze, okay? Think of kids who are constantly abused. Um, being moved from home to home to home, we talked about this a few minutes ago. Being removed from siblings. And when we were talking about abuse from a couple of seconds ago, all the different types of abuse. Emotional, physical, sexual. Neglect. Neglect, absolutely. So we're going to be focusing on some of the toxic stress today. So we have the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord. Okay, that's what we initially talked about with the, the anatomy physiology lesson a few minutes ago. Then we have our peripheral nervous system. There's nerve fibers that come off to the side. Part of one of the main nerves that we're going to be focusing on a little bit in the parasympathetic nervous system is the vagus nerve and talking about vagal tone. Anyone know what vagal tone is? Just because I'm 
standing up here like, you know, when I'm teaching my class, anyone? Have you read, done your reading for today? <laughs> well, thank you in the back for, for raising your hand. Okay, the, the vagus nerve, it's the 10th uh, cranial nerve, known as cranial nerve X, hence X10, um, also known as the wandering nerve because there are actually two nerves, the right side, left side, that wander down throughout the system, uh, throughout the body, the whole way down to the gut and affect you uh, in the parasympathetic nervous system, um, showing how, well, not showing, but giving your body the ability to calm back down. And we're not gonna get into too much depth with that, other than vagal tone is being able to calm that, in essence, calm your body down much more quickly than nurturing conversation with somebody. Do you wanna go through autonomic? Okay, I'll just keep on. <laughs> Okay, the autonomic nervous system controls uh, involuntary uh, bodily functions, breathing, blood pressure, heartbeat, dilation, constriction of blood vessels, the stuff that we don't have to control. You know, it gets bright in here, you're not all thinking, okay, I've got to get my pupils to dilate, <laughs> actually shrink. It gets dark in here to dilate. But next up, we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Think of the sympathetic nervous system as the gas pedal. Something happens, our adrenaline kicks in, body starts shaking, cortisol flushing through our system. We are ready for fi uh, fight, flight, freeze, okay? Once that event is over, we need these chemicals to leave our body, be broken down. Parasympathetic nervous system kicks in, okay? That's where we're able to you know, with, with sympathetic, it's fight, fight, or freeze. Parasympathetic, think of rest and digest. Part of the sympathetic nervous system is the stopping of the gut from digesting. Sympathetic, parasympathetic is to allow it to start up. Now when we look at this, okay, the stress response in the sympathetic nervous system, something big happens, all right? And I'm gonna turn this around momentarily because I don't want this whole thing to be focused on negative stressors. Okay, think of a time when your pupils expanded, when you had fast, shallow breathing, when your heart was pumping faster, beating out of your chest, your gut was inactive, okay? The feeling of your gut being inactive, this might give this whole thing away. Butterflies in your stomach? Okay. Everyone's trying to think because you're in this presentation on toxic stress of something traumatic that happened in your lives. How about this one? You remember your first crush? <laughs> I see so many smiles and they're like, oh my gosh, my heart's starting to beat faster a little bit again, a little bit shallow breathing, butterflies in my stomach from remembering that. Okay, you can't tell right now, but your pupils are expanding. I can't see them from here, but I'm guaranteeing they are. It's part of the sympathetic nervous system. <laughs> and okay, other, other fun events, the first time you got to drive a car by yourself. Your caregiver, not in the car, that little bit of freedom. Your first preparation to go off to school. Your acceptance letter to wherever you went. All right, these types of things elicit the same type of response that a traumatic event can elicit, okay? The fast, shallow breathing the heart pumping faster. Now imagine if that feeling persisted constantly throughout the entire relationship with that first crush or while you're driving that car. Adrenaline's busting through your system and you're trying to drive a car. Okay. Are you able to think about pretty much anything else other than what else going on right there? With that first crush, were you able to have a deep, conversation with that person or with just kind of biting on your tongue, stuttering, trying to say something important and, and funny? Could you even use words? I, I know I was a, a blubbering mess. I tried. Okay, so what happens once that, let's say that crush walks out? You know, walks not out of your life, but walks out of the room. Okay, first up, you're telling all your friends, oh my gosh, so-and-so was here, can you believe that? Okay, after that, your pupils start to shrink back down. The butterflies in your stomach, eventually you're gonna go away. You're able to breathe at a normal tone. 
heart slows back down, you're able to function normally. Now, we've got a little bit of a scenario here, though. Let's flip this around to other types of stress. These are all the symptoms we talked about. All right, so is anyone familiar with what they call the HPA axis feedback loop? I, this is about as technical as we're gonna get, and I'm not, when we talk about this feedback loop, I'm gonna give you a bit of a scenario. So it's a nice, beautiful Orlando day, and since I'm a natural uh, native Orlandoan, um, I'm gonna take you all out for a walk so we can enjoy the nice weather before it gets too hot down here. When we're out walking, so if you imagine, we run into a bear. Now, before, before we do the fight, flight, and freeze, our bodies are amazing and so are our brain. They're running through a lot of things. Our pituitary glands are starting to kick in, our adrenal glands, our heart's beating faster, you know, our eyes pupillate. I'm not looking at all of you guys, I'm just looking at the bear. And our brain screams to release the stress hormones and we get flooded with adrenaline and cortisol and everything we need to be protective. And that's how great our body is because it's protective. We need to get away from that bear and then we're gonna fight, flight, or freeze. Now, imagine you're sitting at home at night with your Netflix or whatever and the bear comes in and sits down next to you and says, what's for dinner? <laughs> what is adaptive and here to help us can become negative and maladaptive because now we're being triggered all the time and this is the feedback loop our kids give with trauma. Just like whenever the bear shows up, like he's been watching the Burger King commercial with a crown who's always out there like when you're in the shower, every time you're thinking about the bear, these are being triggered and that's the feedback loop that our kids go through and this is when we're explaining what toxic stress is that's it. You are being constantly triggered. Our pituitary glands are constantly active. And you have so many other medical or symptoms because you're already, like a teenager learning how to drive a car, your gas and brake are constantly going like this. You're just doing that jerky movement of being in the car with a kid teaching them to drive. So just imagine that happening over and over and over again. Back to the bear. The bear comes back home every single night, beats up your caregiver, slaps you around every single night. It's and gonna sometimes wear it's not even the bear. Sometimes it's something that reminds you of the bear, the smell. I've had kids that I worked with that said, if I still hear a can open, I get triggered because I knew that's when dad was gonna be difficult, the second you heard the can. So all of these memories that are innate in us, we don't even need the bear present, the bear present anymore. Now let's turn this a little bit into something a little bit more tangible for a lot of us. Not all of us have been through repetitive traumatic experiences. Imagine going to your favorite sports game, for those of you that are sports fans, okay? Going to watch Nittany Lions, okay? Beginning of the day, start cheering, go team. You're yelling in the stands. Maybe you're at a concert, you're cheering for whatever your favorite band is, okay? by the end of the day, doing the exact same cheer, okay? Yeah, go whomever. By the end of the day, instead of, yeah, go whomever, it's, ah, go, ah, ah. you don't have a voice, right? Okay, you've worn it out. I see people like, yeah, I've been there. Can't wait for football season. Oh, and your arm's tired. Yeah, your arm's tired from cheering, okay. You raise your hand up once, no problem. Hold your hand up for two hours, see what happens. Do it day in, day in, day in, day out. Other than having a huge arm for being able to do that, you're gonna get tired, you're gonna wear out. This type of stuff happens the exact same way with the neurochemistry of the brain. Okay, the cortisol and adrenaline that are going through your system during the, or during the sympathetic nervous response, they are actually toxins. Cortisol is a toxin that breaks down the neurotransmitters and the neurons in the, in the brain. Bringing us back to what? Bringing us back to the more primary needs that we have. When we are overwhelmed, how many of us are able to, well, I know there's a few lawyers in here who have just ridiculous skills at this, but when in a traumatic situation or a stressful situation, are you able usually to think about exactly what you want to say in that situation? 
Or is it more of, whoa, this person's upset. A couple hours later, y'all know what the, the shower argument is? You know, when we get in an argument with our significant other, a little while later you get in the shower and water's flowing on, and you're like, oh my gosh, if I had said this, I totally would have just had that conversation. I'm going to go back. Sometimes you go back out and start the argument again. But when, you, but when you do, you can't think of those exact same words because you're again under stress. Same type thing, okay? When we're under stress, we're not able to have the, the cognitive abilities, the uh, ability to verbalize our feelings nearly as well. When we have our kids in the home that are upset, how many of them are able to truly tell you the impetus of their frustration during the heat of the, of the event? Tied to that, how many of them are able to discuss afterwards what exactly happened during the event? You know when the kids say, I don't remember? Scientifically, a lot of the kids went overwhelmed, I mean, people for that matter, when overwhelmed, it's simply because, okay, when we're talking about the brain anatomy again, they have flipped their lid. They're not able to use the the frontal cortex, they're not able to have a true conversation to cognitively understand what's going on. They have experienced trauma in the past, so what happens is their brain goes back to how do I survive? How do I get out of this situation? Do I need to flee? Do I need to fight? This is where we are after, tr after toxic uh, stress affects our brain. Okay, the cortisol has, we'll get into showing a PET scan in a minute, but the cortisol has damaged the brain, and yes, damaged the brain, to the point where the child cannot cognitively understand what a lot of children who are the same chronological age who have not gone through so much trauma are able to process at that age. We have a question back here. Yeah. Um, okay. Because we're being recorded, we need you on the mic. So my question, um, you were talking about how, you know, in that moment, how effectively are you able to communicate? And so for some teenagers that I happen to represent, it, it comes out in anger and in cussing staff out, which then leads to a, to a disruption and another placement and more trauma. And it's, it's a vicious cycle that we see all the time. How, either on the part of a child maybe you're talking with, or even a caregiver in a foster home, in a group home, in those situations, how do you try and implement some type of understanding or effective communication strategy so then it doesn't blow up as, as large as it does? What an absolutely fantastic question. If I could have planted her here, which I didn't, by the way, but. Thank you, I'll pay you later. Um, <laughs> this is exactly where we're going with this. Okay, how, how do we work with these children? What do we do in this situation? How do we prevent this disruption? Therapeutically, what's the best mode to address these situations? Okay, again, when a child is overwhelmed, a child is overwhelmed. When we're overwhelmed, we're overwhelmed. The best thing to do is say, hey, calm down, right? Oh, and no one in the history of calming down has ever calmed down exactly. by being told to calm down. Exactly. I've learned that through asking my wife that once. And my couch is very comfortable. <laughs> and, you know, my specialty is working with teenagers on a crisis unit, and I've done a lot of research on what we do when they get triggered, especially when you're in those situations. And when we talk about the brain, as Chad, I think, was heading for, we need to talk to them in a calmer state. And I know the biggest difference that it made in my 11 years where we really switched how we had kids that would act out was when they came in in a calm state, we would spend time with them and ask them questions about, have you ever been restrained before? Okay, so now I know if you're upset, I need to approach you so you can see both my hands. Because if you don't see one of my hands, you might already be looking for it. Um, what are some of the ways that I know you can be angry or frustrated? What are some of the things that calm you down? So I know if Chad's upset and he likes to take a walk, I'm like, hey Chad, you know, can I walk with you? We don't even need to talk, but I know 
that I'm there with them because now I know individually what helps them. And you know, basic things are when our kids would act up, we would say, do you respond better to a male or female when we had to do the intervention? And in trying to remain calm, and I know that's the hardest thing, trying to remain calm when they are upset, trying to keep that calm voice. Um, my son calls this voice my social work voice because I talk like this all the time. Uh, it, he does not, this does not calm him down, just so you know. Uh, he says I better scream at him because he doesn't like this voice. Uh, but you know, trying to be in charge of our own voices and our own reactions so that we're mirroring them. So I know that when kids act up, a lot of times I even bring my voice down. The quieter I go, because if you're loud, eventually <laughs> they, you know, lower their voice and start to calm down. Absolutely. And tied to that is, I mean, again, fantastic question, is the multidisciplinary team approach mm -hmm. that a lot of us use, a lot of us need to use a lot more of. Okay, the communication between guardian and litem, between the therapists, between the psychiatrists, between caregivers, between the teachers, between the uh, psychi did I just mention psychiatrists? I think I did. Prime, we'll go primary care physician. All these people that are part of the multidisciplinary team need to all be on the same page. How do we address this issue when this child is reacting this way? Okay, in a therapeutic mindset, we don't look so much at what the current problem is, but what happened to this child for this child to want or need to react this way. Let's address the problematic situation which brought this child the coping skills that he or she lacks or that they currently utilize when they are that frustrated, when they are that overwhelmed, when they're not able to process. A tough one is, okay, when we're working in the foster homes, okay? Again, up there with the GAL, up there with case managers, foster parents. What they go through, okay, this is their home. These are children that come in that are having a tough time. And I don't want to say these children are broken, but they have a lot of challenges. They have a lot of needs. And when we talk about children who haven't had all this trauma happen to them, we think, okay, this, this kid just needs some structure and some consistency, and we'll make them ship shape in no time. No. These children need far more than that. They need to feel safe. They need to feel secure. They need to feel that your home is their home and not a temporary place to stay until I get bumped to the next home. They need to, another thing, I mean, our kids need to feel, and this is all kids, they need to feel seen and heard. Some of the biggest misunderstandings, even as an adult, you know, <sighs> I'm a pretty good social worker, I think, but even so effective, like we're talking with my husband, sometimes my communication skills aren't that good because I'm on Facebook, I'm watching a movie, I'm not seeing or listening to him when he's telling me something. And just like that, our kids, they've been shuffled around or moved around, they've had placement disruptions, even when they find their forever home, you know, they still need to be seen and heard, and sometimes they're acting out because they really do. There is that... I know people say attention seeking, you'll never hear me say that word. There is that relationship seeking component that you see these kids that are doing when they're acting out, when they're constantly saying, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me, or they're telling you the same thing over and over again. They are actually searching for that relationship, that attachment. And at the end of the day, if the most important thing that I think I found is to make sure you know, that they are seen and heard and I'm paying attention you know, when I'm with them. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. And that jumps through a whole bunch of our slides too. So thank you. So we were talking earlier about brain structure, okay? Looking right here, this is a PET scan, positron emissions tomography. Basically what it's doing is it is showing brain functioning in two separate children, okay? Children same age, child up here, healthy brain. Well, that was right in my eyes. <laughs> okay? Okay, these brighter areas up here are showing neural transmissions. They're showing the functioning of the brain. 
Okay, they're showing the ability, okay, again, this is in the temporal lobe, so the ability to reason, the ability to uh, have cognitive understanding. Okay, other side, the brain of an abused child, same age. Okay, we still, down here, this is a view basically up. Okay, back of the head, front of the head, going that direction towards the top. All right, so brainstem activity, primitive brain, still firing. Okay, we still need our basic needs met. Okay, this is where, in here, basic, simple needs being met. Primitive type activities. Healthy brain is showing the ability to have more cognition, the ability to understand, ability to reason, ability to learn, to verbalize. A child who's been abused, okay, the toxic effects have gone, the toxins, the oxytocin, has gone through the system over and over and over again, literally showing damage to that part of the brain. Now, someone's question inevitably is going to be, can those children develop that back? Absolutely. As therapists, we need to address how to do that, though. Okay, sir? Hang on. I want to make sure you're on the mic. So when this is used for future teachings, people can go, that guy asked a great question. Oh, no pressure, no pressure there, Nat. Yes, so the question I have is looking at these maps, neurodegeneration and neuroregeneration, I'm sure where you're going. Yep. But in child welfare, a controversial topic is, do you treat a child psychotropically to build the supports they need to, to grow those paths, like giving a cane to somebody who's in PT? Sure. And where do we find that balance with the current culture in psychotropic meds? Yeah, this is an excellent question. Um, basically, if you look at studies where we have provided psychotropic meds versus we have uh, applied, let's say, uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. We've tried nothing, or we've tried both. What the studies have shown is using psychotropic meds gives the, bra the brain and body the ability to utilize neurochemistry, you know, the, the uh, basically the uh, neurohomeostasis of the, the chemicals in the brain to be able to understand what's going on or to be able to calm those symptoms. Whereas the therapy provides them with the ability to understand and utilize coping skills. When used together, you're hitting it from both sides, usually much more beneficial than one or the other or none. Is that the question, is that how you're asking? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm asking, but the approach usually is medication is the last resort once things get to a certain point. Sure. How to find a balance with the child welfare system. Yeah. How to find a balance? Well, you know, part of that is, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a PhD, not an MD, so I, I don't want to get into, you know, what medications are most beneficial, but uh, the way I look at it from a therapeutic standpoint is, Let's try therapy, let's try, okay, like I mentioned earlier, we're going to work on security, we're going to work on comfort, we're going to work on building the relationship where they feel secure enough and comfortable enough to be able to talk to us about past traumas and hopefully learn and utilize more positive coping mechanisms. If, however, that's not beneficial, we get an evaluation from a psychiatrist, maybe there's a neurochemical issue going on, uh, various comorbid conditions, and evaluate from there. Yep, part of the multidisciplinary team. Sir. Just um, pretty much um, same, the same question, but a different um, approach. Okay. At what age does a PET scan begin to show these symptoms? And at what age would a PET, can, PET scan not be an effective tool to show these types of symptoms. In other words, um, I've been under a general impression that a psychiatric diagnosis uh -huh. at too young an age is not an effective indicator of um, long-term mental health or 
these types of problems. Without question, you're absolutely right. Paul, yes, you and I believe up? this right here, I believe he's six, five or six, if I remember correctly, the age for this PET scan. And when we look at psychiatric disorders, you know, as I said, my background is crisis and substance abuse. You need time for people to develop because when you come from a substance abuse background, you don't diagnose for the first couple months someone's in recovery because symptoms can be mirrored other things. So, oh, they're paranoid, they're this, we need to give them this, disor this diagnosis. I'm like, okay, but they were using cocaine daily. So, yes, they're paranoid. It's actually taking time to work with and find comfort because a lot of disorders can, we can all look diagnosable very quickly. And there is no DSM diagnosis for normal. So there is no normalcy. So it's taking the time with the kids when we're working them. We don't want to label someone too early or diagnose them just because these diagnoses follow them for the rest of their life. And also it's kind of hard when I don't see tons of things being diagnosed as PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder because the kids are not going to tell you I'm having nightmares. These are my ouchy points. This is what I keep getting triggered because they don't like the vulnerability. So sometimes that's why we get wrong labels. I'm going to steal your mic for a second because we have a mic ready for another question. But tied to that, um, when we do the PET scan, it can be done multiple times throughout uh, development. Uh, you can see how the brain is, be is able to regenerate. Um, but again, like we're talking about here is you want to start from the base up. And once you're able to have those cognitions, the brain is going to rewire itself to be able to have higher cognitive functioning. So it will show uh, more imaging in that, in that frontal lobe and in, in the uh, uh, parietal lobe as well. Sir? Um, much of what you've described in children, uh, we see in their parents. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of these kids, I mean, they're second, third generation in the system or should have been in the system. Sure. It, uh, is there a, a point where it's, it's irreversible? Uh, you know, some of these parents in their 20s or 30s who need attention like this, it, 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 is it effective? Mm -hmm. Are you saying the parents or are you saying the kids? The parents. Parents. Okay. Um, one thing, you know, I, I'm going to add, add the caveat, I work with children and adolescents up to 18. Some of them are parents. Um, it's more challenging, I, I personally believe, in modifying parental behaviors than modifying the behaviors in children, simply because they've had so many years to hone those skills, to use those coping mechanisms. They have been traumatized potentially for a long time which would cause more you know, additional brain dysfunction. Is it possible to reverse that? Sure. With children, I feel it's a lot more readily reversible because the, the child's brain is still growing and developing. They haven't had the number of years or ex, uh, the amount of exposure to the various uh, traumatic events. And if put in the proper environment, they're able to be shown that there is a caregiver or someone that is overlooking what they do to be able to show them what we would societally consider right from wrong, uh, a positive nurturing environment, uh, secure home, um, these types of, of, of uh, needs that they, that they need to have met, whereas the parent may not have that ability because more often than not they're on their own. They don't have a, a parental figure who is now grounding them if they come in late. And uh, from my experience, I just want to pass on. Uh, when working with adults with substance abuse, have you ever seen someone who has 10 years of substance abuse and you meet them and now they're like 30 but they still act like they're 16? Substance abuse and those chemicals, they stunt our emotional intelligence and our emotional growth. So they are still, for the point they're using daily, they're no longer having that EQ grow. And like when we're talking about trauma and the, the loop where you constantly are being triggered and you're down in this crisis brain, it's kind of around the same thing. You're not gonna have a lot of emotional growth in a time when you're constantly being triggered. So yes, we can recover and with adults, they can through work, but it also takes time and support. So we've seen people that when they're first clean, 
they act a lot younger, but as they develop in the next year or two in their chips, you see their EQ catching up. And the same thing with trauma. When you can give them a safe place to land, you can see that they will start to flourish and rebuild some of these structures because they're not being triggered constantly. And something to remember, this stuff doesn't happen overnight and it can't be cured overnight. There is no magic pill that is going to change all behaviors, all coping skills and make someone feel totally safe and able to explain types of trauma and various uh, things that have happened to them which have caused distress. We have to be able to build up, again, from the base up. We have to give them that comfort, that structure, that need that they have to be able to feel comfortable enough with us, again, as a multidisciplinary team, to be able to thrive and flourish. You have a question over here? Yes, yeah, so oh, coming around. Again, we're on camera, so I want to make sure heard and there's that bear we were talking about earlier. Thank you. Um, so for children who've been removed from their parents who are very bonded to their parents and they're maybe in the process of reunification and they're in foster care, would you say that that, that being in foster care inherently causes them toxic stress? I would say absolutely not. Um, what I'll walk behind you. I don't want to get attacked by the bear. Okay, so there is definitely stress associated with being moved into a foster home. Okay, we are taken away from those who we feel are the people that are supposed to care for us, the people that are supposed to be there when we need them, the person that's supposed to tuck us in at night. Okay, unfortunately, a lot of the parents don't quite have those skills to be able to provide to their children. Therefore, the children are removed for a certain reason. Is that a traumatic event? Without question. If we're working towards reunification, we're working together with the family, with the case managers, with guardian at litem, with the attorneys, with the psychiatrists, with the teachers, then we have a far better capability of, well, getting too close to that thing again. Get any feedback there? A little bit. I don't know how to turn this one down, so sorry. But we have a. F oh, yeah. That's why I was like this. Okay. Better. Okay. We have a far better ability to bring in. Okay, remember the parasympathetic nervous system, the ability to calm down, relax, working together with the parents and the foster parents as a team. That that type of stress is diminished greatly. Now, if the parents aren't working their case plan or unable to work their case plan for whatever reason, the child is still having significant problems where the foster parents don't feel they're capable of meeting the child's needs, child's bounced from home to home to home, yes, that's traumatic. That can, be, that can develop toxic stress without question because we're putting them in a brand new environment over and over again. Brand new rules, brand new family, brand new school, possibly new friends, new siblings, Maybe new pets. Maybe they have to share a room with somebody. All these are stressors. Now we do this over and over and over and over again. Same thing about screaming at the, at the football game. Over and over and over again, it wears the brain out. If we can get the children back into the reunified, being reunified with their biological parents or whomever they originally were removed from, and the, the parents have the skills to be able to provide that nurturing and structure that they're in, in dire need of, then we run a much better chance of uh, being able to allow these children to overcome those frustrations and stresses. All right, so let's talk about the impact, the behavioral, social, and emotional. We've been talking a lot about it, but there are some things that I also like to pull up. We know what hyperarousal is, right, that we're constantly looking, but persistent fear response. When you start seeing that persistent fear response or the fear that starts manifesting, I know that uh, working with some of the veterans that I volunteer with, they get fear, start having fear responses coming up on holidays like 4th of July because of the fireworks. 
they have started having signs saying, please not around this house because combat vets. When we talk about it, you know that something scary is coming up and you start getting yourself into those feedback loops, you know, because they were anxious and now you're anxious that you're anxious, but you're anxious that you're not anxious enough and now you're anxious that you're too anxious. Makes you kind of anxious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the one I always like to really talk about, and these are some of the things that I see a lot with the teenagers that I work with, is a weekend response to positive feedback. I think it's this one. Give me this. Give me that one. I've already adjusted to it. It's off. All right. Um, so weekend response to positive feedback. If you notice the kids who have been through a lot, you try to say, you know, good job. I'm really proud of you. You know, you worked hard. And they're like, eh. Or they just, they can't take it. They're like, they don't take praise well because they don't really understand or trust what you're saying. Or they don't see it in themselves because the way they see themselves is different. And I see a lot of that with them, especially my teenagers, and complicated social interactions because they might be normal in certain areas, what classify normal, they can get along decently. You know, hey, I'm great when I'm up here with the microphone in the conference, but when the microphone's down, um, I'm going to hightail it out of here because if you all want to talk to me. Those are the complicated social that don't always line up. So they might do well in certain areas, but very poorly in other areas where it doesn't actually look like it should apply. How do you best address that? Hmm? Those two areas in your teenagers. How do you best address that? How do you best address that? Okay. <laughs> Um, a lot of what we're saying, you have to have that reinforcement, you know, working. I know that working with some of the teenagers that I work with with social interaction, um, doing role plays with them, doing comfortabilities. One of the most important things I've actually done is teaching kids uh, job interview skills. But I make them interview me and I walk in acting like them so that they can see the mirror and the differences and then I I start from that area and go backwards. So finding a creative way that works with the kiddos you're working with. Because we all know everyone doesn't learn the same. Um, and just that when we're talking about positive feedback, trying to have them um, work on what they're good at, having them start to see some of their strengths. And it takes time and constant reinforcement. And that's why, again, all of our interactions, even if it's that quick, mundane, five-minute interaction is so important. And tied to that is, I think, is it, are we good? Okay. I guess listening to the last mic compared to this one, it's like an explosion versus a whisper. But tied to that it, it, yeah, is okay, the need to provide support for the simplest things. Okay. We all focus on, okay, we all know who the bad kid in school was, right? How many teachers after having a, a, a day in the classroom, are able to say, oh, that kid, that kid, that kid, they were good. Or do we all focus on, that kid was a pain in the you know what today. That kid was bouncing off the walls. I had to send XYZ kid to the principal twice today, okay? And we focus on the problematic things. It's, it's inherent in what, what all of us do. How many, I mean, you look at the news. How often in the news do they report something wonderful that happened? Or is there always something controversial with this various twist, right? The human interest piece. Yeah, the human interest stuff. It's, it, it's much more few and far between. But when working with these kids, focus on those little things, okay? Kid draws you a picture. You know, it, it's a picture of you. It may look like, you know, a, a baseball with three sticks coming out, and you're like, oh, that's beautiful. What is that? Oh, that's you. <laughs> and, I'm happy <laughs> and with that, your response is, that is the absolute best picture I've ever seen. Let me put it up somewhere prominent in my office to show how much I appreciate what you've done for me. Thank you so much. Can I put this up here behind my desk? I'll put it over my diploma. For those of you that know that I graduated from Florida State, I guess I'll cover it up for the Florida fans in here. But, okay. Focusing on those little things, giving that kid the sense that they are worthy, that they, are, that they deserve love, they deserve safety. We've got to focus on that so much more.
tied into that? Yes. That's the dangerous one. Yeah. So with everything that you've reviewed so more about what these kids need, um, how do you reconcile that with the traditional school discipline system? So, I mean, these kids, the, aside from foster care and the group placements, they're still going to go to school every day. And for every support that there is, there's still those situations where you end up with suspensions and you end up with referrals. So can you speak a little to kind of how to make those two jive? Okay. Now, that is a definite big challenge. Why? Because there are certain expectations of the teacher-child relationship. Um, let's look at our school systems, especially the public school systems. Our teachers are overwhelmed. The number of kids that are in there who either have a misdiagnosis or no diagnosis at all that aren't having their needs met are making their jobs that much more challenging. Okay? So what we need to be looking at is, again, back to what I was talking about earlier, multidisciplinary team approach. Okay? When something is identified as a traumatic event that has happened in this child's life, okay, we're talk again, we're talking about children in the system right now, okay? Um, we need to address that with the case manager. What has been done to help alleviate what's going on in this child's life? Okay, what happened to this child? Tied to that, does the teacher understand? Do the foster parents understand? Okay. Case manager may understand, may not understand. Therapists, do they know what all happened? I know we all talk about the difficulty of getting paperwork from one place to another place to another place. We need to have that working much more smoothly. Do I know how to do that? Um, pray, <laughs> miracle. Um, oh. Hi there, I'm gonna jump in. I, I get to be part of this wonderful team. Hi, good morning, uh, afternoon, I'm Kim Puritan. But no, I think just honestly to that point too, you all are able to also contact you know, the school, whomever that point person would be as an advocate and be present at, um, you know, at those multidisciplinary meetings so there may be an awareness. And there's also components inherent in, multi, in, um, in many school districts where they do have foster care liaisons and if getting connected with those persons, you could even go on the on the school board websites and, and search for um, if there is a foster care liaison to check to see who that person is, because they're really advocating as well. And you also can become part, well, you know that already, but becoming part of that multidisciplinary approach. Um, but the schools really do need that input and can also pass that along to the teacher or you know whomever else that's seeking to find the best resolution for some of the, the problems the child is facing and they just need more input and more data. So, if, um, but f make sure that you know that that's available to you as an advocate for the, for the child and really just support family members that, that may come to you with that question. But great question, thank you. Okay. Educational surrogates are phenomenal. Yes, I'll hold it down. Actually, I was going to give that example. Um, I'm from Broward, and in our district, we actually have um, legal aid attorneys. And I find especially that the education attorneys are extremely helpful at getting things like IEPs in place and getting testing and evaluations done. Um, and it kind of makes our job easier because that's one place where I can step back a little bit and just help my CAM instead be like, okay, what do you need me to get to the education attorney so that we can get this resolved? Um, and I find a lot of times that especially, I guess, I don't know if it's just because it's legal aid, but I find that they're more on top of it, um, sometimes even more than the private attorneys, and they really help like push the kids through the system faster to get um, goals accomplished. So if you have legal aid or educational attorney ad items, I would encourage you to reach out to them because I find that they're really, really helpful in this issue and educational circuits, as he said. <laughs> yes, and we also, depending on the areas, I've trained in a bunch of schools. So I've trained teachers at schools. So some areas do have us come in and start doing the trauma training and the toxic stress to their teachers and school social workers and uh, administrators, so depending on that area. Okay, so what are some beneficial prevention techniques, therapeutic techniques that work well? I mean, we've already talked about providing the, the basic needs of the child, the, the security, the comfort, et cetera. 
We also have the California Evidence-Based Clearinghouse for Child Welfare. Check that website out. It gives a lot of great strategies. Multidimensional treatment, foster care for preschoolers. Okay, again, ties in many different aspects of life. Again, also for preschoolers, the little ones. Okay, let's start young. Let's start with their basic needs and show that as a team, we're working together to provide them with what they need to be able to sustain, to be able to understand, to be able to develop, oftentimes to be able to catch up. The microsocial video coaching intervention, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it is amazing. What it is is video coaching, but it also talks about looking at our body language, how we can recognize emotions, how we can display emotions, and it's this video coaching that works with our kids for interactions but it's also less threatening because they're looking at a screen and we know our kids love our, their screens, don't they? Early Head Start programs, I think we're all very familiar with those, so we won't get into a whole lot of detail with, with that. But one that isn't on here, uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, works really well with multiple different levels of cognitive capability, emotional age, chronological age, and uh, if you ever get the opportunity to get into one of those trainings, by all means, it's well worthwhile. Are there any other questions? Oh, we've got a couple more here. Sorry. Well, and these are just some of our other intervention techniques. We all know meditation can work, creative visualization, trauma-sensitive yoga. We are also talking lunch about uh, they're doing yoga with goats, and I can't wait to go to that. Um, physical activity, you know, one of the best things that when we started to, at our crisis unit, we started changing so that there was some exercise or walking at night because when our kids go down, they get flooded and, you know, when I go lay down, I think, oh, is the garage open? Where am I going tomorrow? What's this? Do I need this? But we all know that if our kids can't sleep or constantly being triggered, physical activity, if our body is physically tired, our mind will rest and we will go to sleep. Um, different types of relaxation, figuring out what works for them. And of course, having a social support, because we know just the one person that we can talk to that we know will answer the phone when we call already increases our ability to become resilient. And we want to help our kids become more and more resilient. And these are just some of the things that we can use and implement with them or encourage. So back to the other thing I just said. Any other questions? Sure. I don't trust that microphone. Um, my, my question is, um, we, so we get a lot of cases in where kids may be really, really young um, and see their parents involved in domestic violence, let's say one-year-olds or two-year-olds. My question is, what is the difference between play therapy and individual counseling? What's the cutoff age for play therapy? And I guess, I know you mentioned the earliest you've treated is 18 months, but how early can we engage children in play therapy? There is no cutoff for play therapy, just so you know. I've actually seen them work with adults for play therapy, especially who have been traumatized, because you're actually talking about reintegration and different ways. So there is play therapy that you can use throughout, so there is not really a cutoff. But um, play therapy is completely different uh, than when we talk about our individual coaching uh, and counseling. Because, I mean, we can all use play and therapy. As, I'm not a play therapist, but I am a therapist. So I could treat you numerous different modalities and incorporate it. When we actually talk about play therapy, do you have a lot of experience with play therapy? Like uh, actual play therapists? I have utilized play in therapy. I wouldn't call myself a play therapist. Uh, in working with the really young ones, absolutely. You use a lot of uh, peripheral techniques, you know, learning to share, playing with different things, using coloring or artistic expression as a means to um, address an issue without having to talk about it. Because often, the young, especially the younger ones, don't have the capability of talking about it. But it's understanding themselves and also giving them a, a nurturing, calm environment where they can feel comfortable in talking about things. And uh, like, like Paula mentioned, it can work through a lifespan, depending on how the, you know, what's going on with the person, how they interact, how they react. And it, it truly, I mean, it, there's so many different modalities of therapy. If one doesn't work, attempt another, give it a whirl. 
if play therapy is working, there's no need to really stop it if, unless there's something additional going on that a different type of thera uh, therapeutic modality would benefit uh, in a more rapid manner. And I know from my experience also, I've always made sure that uh, kids who've been through trauma, my desk will have silly putty, it has you know crowns, different things because what do we do when we're not comfortable doing something? We fidget, and our kids fidget. Giving them something to play with will help with the fidget and help distract. You know, because I know that when we are working with helping people quit smoking, we gave them silly putty so they always had something in their hand or something they could play with in their pocket when they had cravings. So figuring out what works for our kids and having things available for them. And we have time for one or two more questions and we'll let you get on your way. Do you guys utilize uh, learning your children's ACE scores in determining if they have been exposed to toxic stress? And then is that being implemented in uh, school for people who are trying to become therapists going forward? Because I don't see that talked about and in learning about what toxic stress is. If a child is not engaging in conversation, I would think it would be utilized more prevalent for someone treating them to determine has this child been exposed to toxic stress. Fantastic. Yes. Okay. Two of you get A's for the day. A couple other people over here get A's for the day. Fantastic question that absolutely. Okay, the ACEs, do, do we all know the ACEs study? Adverse childhood experiences? We actually provide a whole other training on that and if we ever get back, to, back in here, we'll, we'll do that one maybe next year. But uh, basically what it is is there are multiple questions that are asked that talk about uh, adverse experiences that have happened in, in a child under 18. Okay, things that have happened to you in your past which could cause various dysfunction in your life and indeed have been proven to show um, a decreased lifespan, uh, the increased probability of cancer or other uh, diseases, um, which Honestly, this is one of the, the big hot therapeutic topics right now. And it, it's definitely something to, I, I, I personally, in, in my teaching at, at the university, I bring it up, it's, it's two of the, I don't know how many days of class we have, but uh, we go through it uh, very intently and I feel that it, it's beneficial for all people in therapy or for that matter, people on insurance plans. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've utilized it. The ACE is getting a lot more accolades and it's been around since 1995, so this is not new science. But uh, if you get a chance to look up Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, she says one of the greatest things that I think about why we are resistant to utilize the ACE and it's because this is not the population over there. So this is not the Orange Blossom Trail area. This is not the impoverished high crime area. This is an area when they do this research where it's a medium age, medium income, medium education. So this is us. And one of the reasons that there is some resistance is because it's not that we're turning the mirror on somebody else. It's because we have to look at our own selves and our own community and the own population that we're in and identify with it. And that's her theory on why the ACE is still struggling to become commonplace. For those of you writing down that name, that's Nadine Burke Harris. And she has a great TED talk on the ACE. Yeah, definitely look it up. Speaking of looking things up, feel free to look up to the next program because uh, we're done. Thank you so Thank much, you everybody. Guys. If you have any questions, please feel free to stop up. <laughs>